the name? My name is Kiran Bakshi. Uh, do you have difficulty in vision? No. Have you had trouble in your eyes? No. Okay. First, we will check visual acuity. To test the acuity of central vision, use a well-lit Snellen eye chart, if possible. Position the patient 20 feet from the chart. Patient who wear glasses other than for reading should put them on. Ask the patient to cover one eye with a card to prevent looking through the fingers and to read the smallest line of print possible. A patient who cannot read the largest letter should be positioned closer to the chart. Note the intervening distance. Identify the smallest line of print where the patient can identify more than half the letters. Visual equity is expressed as two numbers. Example, in my case, what I observed is 20 oblique 20. The first, the, the first indicates the distance of the patient from the chart and the second the distance at which a normal eye can read the letter if the patient cannot read the largest letters, test their ability to count your upraised fingers and distinguish light, such as your flashlight, from the dark. We will do to identify the visual fields by confrontation. Confrontation testing of the visual field is a valuable screening technique for detection of lesions in the anterior and posterior visual pathway. There are two tests in the visual field by confrontation. First is static finger wiggle test and the other one is kinetic red target test. First, we will perform static finger wiggle test. Position yourself about an arm's length away from the patient. Close one eye and have the patient cover the opposite eye while staring at your open eye. So, for example, when the patient covers the left eye to test the visual field of the patient's right eye, you should cover your right eye to mimic the patient's field of view. Place your hands about two feet apart out of the patient's view, roughly literal to the patient's ear. While in this position, wiggle your finger and slowly bring your moving finger forward into the patient's center of view, ask the patient to tell you as soon as he or she sees your finger movement. Test each clock hour or at least each quadrant, test each eye individually and record the extent of visits in each area, note any abnormal field cuts. Next test we will do kinetic red target test. Facing the patient move a 5 mm red top pin inward from beyond the boundary of each quadrant along a line bisecting the horizontal and vertical medians. Ask the patient when the pin first appears to be red. Now we will inspect the position and alignment of the eyes, study in front of the patient and survey the eyes for position and alignment if one or both eyes seem to protrude, assess them from the above. Eyebrows, inspect the eyebrows, noting their fullness, hair distribution and any scaliness of the underlying disease. Eyelids, note the position of the lids in relation to the eyeball, inspect for the width of the palpebral fissures, edema of the lids, color of the lids, lesions, condition and direction of the eyelashes. Lacrimal apparatus. Briefly inspect the region of lacrimal gland and lacrimal sac for swelling. Look for excessive tearing or dryness of the eye. Assessment of dryness may require special testing by an ophthalmoscope. To inspect the conjunctiva and sclera, ask the patient to look up as you depress both lower eyelids with your thumb, exposing the sclera and conjunctiva. Inspect the sclera and palpebral conjunctiva for color. Note the vascular pattern against the white sclera background. The slight vascularity of the sclera is normal and present in most people. If you need a fuller view of the eye, rest your thumb and finger on the bones of the cheek and brow respectively and spread the lid. Ask the patient to look to each side and down. This technique gives you a good view of the sclera and bulbar conjunctiva, but not of the palpebral conjunctiva of the upper lid. For this, you need to evert the lid. For inspecting cornea and lens, with oblique lighting, inspect the cornea of each eye for opacities. Note any opacities in the lens that may be visible through the pupil. For inspecting iris, at the same time, inspect each iris. The marking should be clearly defined, with your light shining directly from the temporal side. Look for a concentric shadow on the medial side of the iris. Because the iris is normally fairly flat and forms a relatively open angle with the cornea, this lighting casts no shadow and the person's iris be normal. Examine the pupils. First, we will do the light reaction test. In dim light, test the pupillary reaction to light. Ask the patient to look into the distance and shine a bright light obliquely into each pupil in turn. Both the distance gaze and oblique lighting helps to prevent a near reaction. Look for the direct reaction, which is the pupillary constriction in the same eye, and the consensual reaction, which is the pupillary constriction in the opposite eye. Always darken the room and use a bright light before deciding that a light reaction is abnormal or absent. Second test for the pupil is the near reaction test. If the reaction to light is impaired or questionable, test the near reaction in both the dim and normal light. Testing one eye at a time makes it easier to concentrate on pupillary responses without the distraction of the extraocular muscles. Hold your finger or pencil about 10 cm from the patient's eye. Ask the patient to look alternatively at it and into the distance directly behind it. Watch for the pupillary constriction with near effort and convergence of the eye. The third component of the near reaction accommodation of the lens that brings the near object into focus is not visible. In my examination, I find out that the light reaction and the near reaction cause his pupils to constrict. Hence, the pupil found to be normal. Now we will inspect extraocular muscles. Standing about two feet directly in front of the patient, shine a light into the patient's eye and ask the patient to look at it. Inspect the light reflection in the corneas. They should be visible slightly nasal to the center of the pupil. Now to test for the six extraocular muscles, ask the patient to follow your finger or pencil as you sweep through the six cardinal directions of gaze, making the wide edge in the ear lead the patient's gaze to the patient's extreme right, to the right and upward, and down to the right, then without pausing in the middle, to the extreme left, to the left and upward, and down to the left. Pause during upward and lateral gaze to detect nystagmus, which is a fine rhythmic oscillations of the eyes. If you suspect lid lag or hyperthyroidism, ask the patient to follow your finger again as you move it slowly from up to down in the midline. The upper eyelid should overlap the iris slightly throughout this movement. Now we are performing the fundoscopy. It is used to assess the retina or the sensory part of the eye. We have to make sure the room is dim lighted, but right now we are not doing the same, just to show the examination. So first we are starting with the red orange reflex of the right eye. It is found to be normal. Left eye also found to be normal with the red orange reflex. Now we will do the anterior segment examination. There is no lesions noted in the sclera and cornea. Now we are performing the uh, left eye anterior segment examination. There is no lesions noted in the sclera and cornea. 
Now we are examining the back portion of the eye. So uh, first we have to make sure the lights are dim in the room and we have to use the vibratic uh, drops to dilate the pupil so that we can easily examine the back side of the eye. So uh, first we have to find the blood vessels and then we have to follow the blood vessels toward the optic disc or optic nerve. Okay, so first we are examining the right eye. Uh, we can see that uh, there is a clear media that means uh, cornea and lens permeated light easily. Uh, we can see the optic disc, optic nerve, optic cup which looks normal. And we can see the vascular arcades, arterioles and venules. Arterioles found to be thinner and lighter as compared to the venules which are darker and thicker. Now, a uh, same examination on the left eye also. Uh, we can see, uh, we can see there's a clear media that means cornea and lens permeated light easily, clearly. Now we can see the optic nerve, optic uh, disc and optic cuff which looks normal. We can see the vascular arcades, arterioles and venules. Arterioles looks thinner and lighter as compared to venules which looks darker and thicker. So we can see that the retinal examination or fundoscopic examination is normal in this patient. Uh, now we are examining the macula. First, in the right eye, uh, we can see the macula which is a darker structure as compared to the surrounding tissues and at the center we can see the fovea which is a depressed structure at the center of the macula. So we can see that we, uh, we have a good foveal reflex in the right eye. Now we are examining the left eye. We can see the macula which is a darker structure as compared to the surrounding tissues and at the center there is a depressed structure known as fovea. Uh, we can see uh, say that in the left eye also there is a good foveal reflex. Hello, uh, can I examine your eye? Yes. Okay, uh, so first we are doing the digital tonometry. It is used to assess the hardness of the eyeball. So uh, we, uh, we are starting with the help of index finger for palpation. So first I will uh, ask the patient to look down and then with the help of one index finger I will stable the eyeball and with the other index finger I will palpate. Uh, so the eyeball is found to be soft. That means it has same consistency as the lips. Thank you for cooperating. Now after the examination, I will wash my hands.